Good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Just want to welcome everyone to the house of the Lord this morning, this Good Friday morning. We have a lot to praise God for and about. We have a lot to worship Him for and about. And there are things that we will be reminded of this morning as well. And so welcome, and an extra welcome if this is your first time with us. I would ask that you stand with me as we read from the Word of the Lord. And I'm going to read from Luke chapter 23, verses 46, verses 26 to 43. Luke 23, beginning at verse 26 through to 43. And as they laid and as they led him away, they seized one Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, and laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. And there followed him a great multitude of the people and of women who were mourning and lamenting for him. But turning to them, Jesus said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. And if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him. This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. The word of the Lord. Father, we thank you. We thank you because you are God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We thank you that because of your love for us that you sent Jesus, into the world to save sinners like us, to save us from sin and the penalty of sin. And we are so very thankful that we are here even today, this morning, not only to rejoice at knowing that you exist, not only to rejoice at knowing that you loved us so much that you sent Jesus to be our Savior, but also to remember that this same Jesus died for our sins. We just ask that you receive our praise and our worship this morning as we sing unto you and as we hear your word. Let it speak to each one of us 
in a way that is meaningful, that we would be open to receiving your word, that we would leave this place different from how we came in, drawn closer to you because of your love and your kindness and your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.
my king of heaven, my king forever. Lift my hands up, lay my whole life down, my whole life down before you. Far too wide, but from the far side of the chasm, you held me in your sight, and you made a way across the great divide. Left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside, and there at the cross. That I owed broke my chains, freed my soul for the first time I had all. Thank you, thank you, Jesus, for the blood apply. Thank you, Jesus, it has watched me why. darkness into glorious 
Thank you, Father. Thank you. You are worthy. You are worthy of all praise and all adoration this morning, oh God. Father, we cannot offer anything to you this morning but our hearts. So we lay ourselves before you, oh God, bare as it gets. Have your way. Have your way, Holy Spirit. Mold us, shape us, change us, transform us, oh God, this morning. Father, I pray that our hearts be so ready, our ears be so attentive today to the voice of God. Lord, we pray that this morning you be the comforter to those who lost a loved one this week, oh God. We pray for Ramona and her family. We pray, oh God, that you be all over your children in this time of sorrow and trouble, oh God. Father, we pray for those who are ill in body. This morning, particularly, God, we lift up Brother Devon before you, oh God. We pray in Jesus' name, as this man has served you all of his life, God, at this time of his need, may you be ever-present help, oh God. May you comfort his bones today, oh God. God, for those who are lacking provision, may you be Jehovah Jireh. You be the provider today, oh God. For those of us who feel are defeated, God, you be Jehovah Nisi. Be our banner today, oh God. The banner of victory over us, oh God. And Lord, may you be lifted up for the remaining of this day and the days to come in our lives, oh God. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Welcome each other. High five somebody. Thank you. Thank you for worshiping. Hannah, thank you, Jordan and the team. Praise God. Hi. Oh, boy. I didn't want to do this, but the, the girls and boys, they are ready with their baskets. Okay. So... We are going to receive something from you, a love offering or some sort. And uh, this is not our normal routine, but whatever it is in your heart, we are going to use it for mission and also for the sidewalk care for, to reach out to our friends on the streets. May the Lord bless you. Come on now that you are ready there to go. Feel free, guys, to let the basket go by. Let's pray. God, this morning we just want to offer up a love offering for the purpose of reaching out to the less fortunate of our city, O oh God. We pray in Jesus' name that you give us wisdom and discernment as how to go about it and use it wisely for your honor and your glory, O oh God, and also for the temporary relief of your creation out there that they are suffering, Father. We pray that you be glorified through it. In Jesus' name. Go ahead, guys. My sincere apologies. We could have uh, prepared you in advance. So sorry about that. <laughs> May the Lord bless you as you bless the Lord today. Just as the offerings are received, let me just encourage you. We have a baptismal service coming up April 21st. If you have been a believer and you've never been baptized or you've been baptized as a little kid and you didn't understand it, so this is your chance to come and join us, and we will explain in details what water baptism is all about. And uh, if you are interested to be baptized after the service, please go to the guest services. There is a form available that you let us know 
what is happening, and then we will, uh, God willing, on that day, we will baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen? I think there is a video about Alpha this morning. Let's see if there is a video. We share things every day. Things that are meaningful to us. That entertain us. Inspire us. Or challenge us. We share moments. Good or bad. Big or small. Because what we share matters. We have the chance to share something incredible. The hope that has transformed our lives. And today, more than ever, people are searching for hope, for connection, for meaning. The life we experience in Jesus is available to our friends and neighbors. And it's easier to share than we might think. Over the next few weeks, we are running Alpha, an opportunity to share Jesus with friends, family, and colleagues in person or online. Each week, we'll connect with each other watch a short video, and have time to discuss our thoughts and questions without needing to have all the answers. All it takes is a simple invitation. Share life, faith, hope, Jesus. Who will you invite? All right, as of next Thursday at 7 o'clock, we are going to, and the subsequent Thursdays to come, we are going to have Alpha Sessions, that's the best time and the best opportunity for you to invite someone, be it a colleague, be it a family member. It's a non-threatening. It is very calm and collective environment, and everyone is welcome to ask any question they might have. It's an amazing course, this one, because we can actually comfortably ask any question we have, and the answers, some will come through the video as we listen and watch, and the other ones, whatever question comes, if we have the answer on the spot, our alpha leader will provide that. If not, we will find it for you. And it's honestly the best opportunity to minister to your family, friends, and colleagues at work. Amen? All it takes, as you heard, an invitation. And uh, I believe many of us, we came to know Christ just by an invitation of somebody who invited us to church. And this morning, many of you are sitting here, a testimony of that, that when we invite somebody, the word of God will not return in void. It will impact the life of our children, families, and colleagues. Amen? So get involved. Be energetic about it. Don't just say, hey, we have something at the church. Excite people about their freedom to ask the question that they might have. And this morning also, some of us, we have been believers for a long time, and we have read the Bible most likely front to back, but there are still some questions. So come and join us. The questions will be answered in Jesus' name. Amen? This morning we are going to talk about the death of our God. Amen? The God who died for man. And no one will die for man on the basis of being his enemy or her enemy. While we were yet enemies of God, he died for us. And this morning we are going to look at this account to see what we can glean from it together. And I pray that your hearts be ready and your ears be attentive. Andrew read our reading for this morning very skillfully. Thank you, Andrew, for doing that. So if you have your Bibles with you, open it up to the book of Colossians. And some of the scriptures will be up here. We are going to look at the account of crucifixion in the light of this passage in the Colossians. Amen? If you are there, just say amen. All right. Colossians 2, verses 6 to 15. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened 
in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophies, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In him, you were also circumcised with the circumcision not performed by the human hands. Your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the circumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us, condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities and made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Father, this morning, we just pray that your word sink deep into our hearts and our minds to your glory and to your honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me give you the background and the setting of this account of crucifixion. To begin with, the act of crucifixion and putting people on the cross was not a Jewish system nor a Roman system. This was invented by Persians and the Persian Empire, whenever they wanted to make an example of someone who was rebellious or committed a very heinous crime, they would put the person on a cross, nail him to that cross, and they would have left him out there in the public so that it will be an example to those who might have the idea of become rebellious or just come against the government of the time. And when the Romans took over, they thought it is an amazing thing to do to get rid of those who might oppose their authority and their government rulings. And there is no system in the Jewish way of punishing people on the cross. Only Romans were doing crossing people. Jewish people, if they wanted to punish somebody, be it for the sin that was committed, be it adultery that they found out, what they would have done, they would have dig a big hole and drop the sinner or the criminal into that hole and collecting people together. The first thing they would have done, if it was a quick uh, transaction as per se, they would have bring a huge big rock and they drop on the head of the person. If that person didn't die with that big rock, then other people would come together and they start to throw rocks at him, the stones at him, till the person dies. One of the greatest examples in the book of Acts is Stephen. Stephen, when they try to punish him, they actually drop him in a hole and people came and they started to throw their stones and what a vision Stephen had. He looked at them and looked at heaven. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. Then Romans, whenever they wanted to make an example of other people, they would put these criminals on the cross and line them up on the roadside that so many will see and not get the idea of opposing the government, or any rulings that came their way. 
By the way, this was not the first account of crucifixion. Before they put a nail Jesus on the cross, there were 1,500 rebellious Jews already on the cross before Christ being crucified. When you look at the death on the cross, as gruesome as it is, it is not quick. It is not quick. They would have left the person on the cross for days at times, and they wouldn't die so quick. When it was too gruesome, then in order to determine if the person is dead, they would have break their legs. At that time, if they were not dead, they would have died. They would have break their bones so that through that excruciating pain, they would have died. How awesome it is when we read the account of our Lord's crucifixion. He did not die because being on the cross. He submitted his own life, his own spirit to the Father. He gave up his life. The life was not taken away from him. He did not die because he couldn't breathe. He did not die because he was in a lot of pain for you and for me. He died voluntarily. He said, Father, to thy hand I submit my spirit. He gave up his life. Nobody took his life away from him. Amen? With that, we are coming to this account of the book of Colossians to see what it's telling us about us, our relationship to Christ, and what Christ has done. The first thing we are going to look at is the human condition, our condition, us. And then later on, I will share with you, because often on a Good Friday, many, many churches, many of our pastors, leaders, we all talk about, you know, the last seven words of Jesus on the cross, you know, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they are doing. Many, they talk about how the Jews, they conspired together and they came against Jesus to crucify him. All of that true and good. But today we are going to focus a little bit about what the thief on the cross said. Amen? We will see how he understood Jesus. And I pray that this morning we be at the place that we want to know who Jesus is. Not just, you know, say, I'm sorry that Jesus died with that painful death. Jesus doesn't need my sympathy or your sympathy. He is my Lord. He is your Lord. He is the author of life. He is the author of our faith. He gives and he takes. Have you noticed? He gave his own life. And oh, what a wonderful story we will have on Sunday when Pastor Rahim will share with us that he took his life back for you and for me. Amen? So human condition. Let's see how we came about and what we are today, tomorrow's, and tomorrow's to come until we see him face to face. This is our condition. When Adam and Eve committed that sin, this is what happened. Romans 5, 12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, which is Adam, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sin. When Adam and Eve committed sin, we inherited two types of death from their sin. Physical death, which is our separation from one another. When somebody dies physically, we are separated from each other. This morning, many of us, we have lost a loved one. And we long to have them with us. Death has separated us from each other. The physical death 
because of Adam's and Eve's sin. There's the second death that happens at that time. When they commit a sin, we died spiritually. We got separated from God. A God who created us to be in fellowship with him, to live with him, to be just perfect in his sight. When we commit a sin, a good God, a righteous God, a just God cannot tolerate sin. A holy God cannot close his eyes, say, okay, let me love you the way you are. Spiritually, we got separated from God. We died spiritually. Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Basically, it explains it. Because we are all sinners, we don't see the glory of God until we come to Him in repentance. We will not have the glory of God in us, for us, and down the road to see Him without repentance. Romans 3, 11 to 18. These are all explaining our condition as a human being and why we need Jesus Christ this morning. There is no one righteous. This morning, none of us are righteous. Start from here. Not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. Believe me, when God sent Adam and Eve out of the garden, they had no desire to seek God. They were just running. Just like the rest of us. We don't seek God. It was God who sought us. It was God who chased us. It is God who is chasing you this morning, who is chasing us this morning. Then it goes on to say, all have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Hey, our good is not good at all. Even when we do good, because the motivation behind it is not good, the good is not good at all. Their throats are open graves. Yes, it is. Start from here. Their tongues practices deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. And the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. There is no fear of God before their eyes. All we have to do, just a quick look at our environment, our society, the things that are happening these days, and it's going to be worse, by the way. All you have to do, be truthful with yourself, look at yourself, and look at the environment. Nothing is good. All you have to do, just turn the TV on, on a news channel. I don't think you can hear anything good. From the moment you open that TV, this is what you hear. Last night was five shooting in Brampton, two shooting in Mississauga. There was a man run over over there. There's a police officer got killed over there. On and on and on and on it goes. And that's just the surface things that they announced to us. The main sinful, unrighteous things are done behind the scene. We don't hear it. It is all over us. This is our condition. This is what is explained to us through the word of God, who we are. And if I take an inventory of my own life, oh boy, it is this and more and more. So I have nothing good to offer 
to anyone, especially to God himself. That's our condition. Amen? Now, when we go on with the account of crucifixion, Jesus was beaten up, tortured, a crown of thorn was put on his forehead, the blood started to run down from his face. You know why? Because he gave up his life so that you and I will live. Point number two, God made us alive in Jesus. God made you and I alive in Jesus. You remember, physically we die. Spiritually we died. God separated from God. But God himself took the initiative to bring us to life through Christ, his son, as we turn to him by faith. Colossians 2.13, when you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. Wow. When Jesus died on the cross, he actually gave us life. He gave us a breath to breathe again. He gave us a chance to be in communion with our Father again. Because when we committed sin, our communion, our fellowship broke with God. You remember it says, God was walking in the breeze of the day, in the garden. And then he called Adam, where are you? God was longing to have a fellowship with Adam and Eve. And when he couldn't see them in front of him, he said, Adam, where are you? Nobody told Adam that you need to hide. Nobody told Adam that they are naked. Nobody told Adam that they have to be shameful and embarrassed. But they realized what they have done. They, they broke their relationship with God. And since then, we keep breaking it and breaking it. When the things are bad, we call God, where are you? When we have best things of life, oh, I'm doing good. I did it. I did it. I did it. But God desired to have that fellowship with us. That is why he allowed his son to go through that painful, torturous moments of his life on the cross so that you and I become alive in him. Amen? Not only he gave us life and made us alive in his son, he also canceled all our debts. He canceled every debt that you might think of. How many of you have mortgages? Here we go. How many of you have car payments? I know the next one that most of the hands will go up. How many of you have credit cards, debts? Oh, there you go. There you go. For a moment, for a moment, just imagine. No matter how much you owe, imagine you receive a letter from your bank or credit card company or your car dealership and that letter comes to you, first of all, you're scared to open it up. But when you open it up, it will say, paid in full. What would you do? I know what would you do. Thank you, Lord, I don't have debt. Now I can rack it up again with another credit card. <laughs> That's what we do. It applies to our spiritual condition too. We know that God has set us free from the power of sin and the bondage that we were in. And now we are free to do whatever we want to do. And we keep doing the same thing over and over and over. And we get ourselves into the bigger debts and bigger debts. Bigger debts, not knowing that it was all paid for. It was all paid for. Jesus paid it all. 
When he died on that cross, he didn't say that I will forgive your today torturing me, spitting on me, cursing me. That's not what Jesus did. Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they are doing. Jesus forgave my sins of the forefathers and my ancestors. Jesus forgave my sin from the day I opened my eyes and started to do whatever we all do. Jesus forgive my sin today. Jesus forgives my sin tomorrow and tomorrow's to come. This is not a one-time deal. Every time you turn to Christ in repentance, you are washed white as snow. Do not hold yourself back from that awesome privilege and blessing. Do not let the enemy whisper in your ears that you are worthless and you have gone so deep that you cannot turn around. There is nothing too deep for God that cannot turn us around back to him. Are you with me this morning? There is no sin too great for God that cannot forgive. And yet, he is looking to you and to me with the last look that he gave to Peter. You know, Peter was an obnoxious guy just like Zia. Have you noticed I just say what I want to say anytime I want to say it? Peter was just like that. Jesus said, I'm going to die for you. Oh, no, no, sir, you're wrong. You ain't going to die. I will die for you. And Jesus said, hey, bud, you will be the first one, actually. Let me burst your bubble right now. You will be the first one that you will deny me three times. I think Peter said, man, you're wrong. <laughs> he couldn't say it loud to Jesus, but in his heart said, you're wrong. You will see. But when the day came that he had to stand for his Lord, he was shaking in front of a slave girl. We cannot do it on our own strength. We cannot stand for anything on our own understanding. We need the last look of Jesus that gave to Peter. When he denied him three times, and about at that time, the rooster said, ah! <laughs> There you go. You know what happened with that sound? Peter remembered what Jesus said a year ago. It was not five hours ago that Jesus said that. Friends, at that time, Jesus gave him the last look. Here where the rubber hit the road for Peter, he realized, oh, how wretched I am. Oh, how ruined I am. He ran to the back alley, bitterly, bitterly cried. That was not a cry of being sorry. That was not a cry of being remorseful. That was a cry of repentance. He realized that Oh, how awful I am and how righteous the Lord is. That when he told me, he knew that this I will do. And yet he gave me that loving last look. Jesus' last look was not to tell Peter, I told you so. He never does that to us. He just said, I love you. I want you to know. No matter what, I love you. This morning, no matter what you have done, no matter what you did this morning, his forgiveness is available and all you have to do, let him give you the last look. Turn to him. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of the earth shall grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. If today you just turn 
your face towards him and look deep into his face, he will give you that last loving look saying, I love you. I love you. That's what he did. He canceled all our debts. Colossians 2.14 Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and is standing against us today, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Oh, I wish we could have laid down a bunch of crosses here with the hammer and nail, that you could have walked here and nailed your own sins and your own troubles to the cross, symbolically say, Jesus, take it all. And he will take it all. He will take it all. He will take it all. He never rejects you and I when we come to him in repentance. Not arrogance. Judas was an arrogant guy. King Saul was an arrogant guy. And if you look at it, honestly, they didn't match a greater sin than the rest of us. King Saul, when Samuel said, go and wait for me to come and do the sacrifice, Saul said, well, Samuel is, you know, either Jamaican or Indian. He's late. He is not showing up. And I have places to go, things to do. He took the matter in his own hand and did the sacrifice. And at that time, Samuel arrived. Said, what have you done? Well, you didn't show up. I had to go somewhere. You know, I had a lunch meeting or whatnot. And therefore, the kingdom was taken away from him. Arrogance, pride, foolishness causes us to listen to the voice of the world that they tell us we are just superstitious. We are just religious. Oh, it doesn't matter this morning what they call us. We know that we know that the King of glory is our Lord, is our Savior. And when the time comes, we all stand before him with them. And then we go to the right. They will go to the left to the barbecue house. I know that for sure. And we need to be repentant and available so that we will bow before him singing the songs of holy, holy, holy is the Lord, God Almighty. Amen? He paid it all. Folks, do not let anybody condemn you. Do not let your soul condemn you because there is no outstanding debt for the children of God because Jesus died and paid it in full. Amen? Not only God made us alive in Jesus, not only he paid all our debts, Jesus reconciled us to the Father. Wow. He caused us to have peace with God. You know, when we commit a sin, that peaceful relationship was broken. Look at Romans 5, 1 to 2. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Friends, when he died on the cross, if you read the account of crucifixion properly, it says there was three hours of darkness. Three hours of darkness came over the whole land. In that three hours of darkness, something amazing took place. What was separating us from God, there was a curtain that separated the presence of God in the Holy of Holies, and no one could go there except the high priest. 
If we wanted to do something with God, we had to go and beg the high priest, confess our sin to the high priest, and then they would have put a chain on the ankle of the high priest to go into the Holy of Holies and intercede for us. And poor guy, if he had his own sins, then he would have died there. Nobody could take him out. That's why they put a chain on him to drag him out. I'm glad no chain is on my legs this morning. In that three dark hours, that wall of separation, that curtain that separated us from God was torn into pieces. And the way was opened. Today, you don't need a high priest. We have the highest priest of all, Jesus Christ. He is sitting at the right hand of the Father. He just sees me. He sees you through, and he says, come on in. The Father is waiting. He opened the way that you and I, we don't have to put our head down before man. We just bow down before God in repentance, and we cry, Abba, 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 Father. He opened the way so that you and I, we will have peace with God. If you want to understand it, this principle better, many of us, we are parents. There are times that our kids do not obey. Whenever my kids did not obey, I said, get out of this room, go to your timeout. But I would go to Mari, I said, would you go and tell them if they come and apologize? will make it right. That is repentance. That's what Jesus did. When we got separated in rebellion and disobedience from the Father, the Father sent Jesus and he allowed him to die so that we can go back to him and ask for forgiveness. So that we can go back to him and make peace with him and have fellowship with him. Here's the question. Do you have fellowship with God now? Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Romans 5, 9 to 11. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Jesus gave up his life that we become death to ourselves. Do you know that on the cross, when Jesus died, you and I, also, we died to our death. When Jesus rose, we rose with him. That's how it works. That's how the Bible explains it. Through his life, we are saved. Not only in this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. If there is any boasting for us today, in our position in the Father, it is because of Jesus Christ. Not because of the work I have done, not because of the intelligence that we have, not because of the achievement that we, you know, acquire, but because of our Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross. Through whom we have now received reconciliation with God. Amen? Next is, God took away the power of our enemies. If I wanted to emphasize anything more than the other ones today, it's this point. Many of us, we constantly say, I'm under attack. Satan is not leaving me alone. Satan is this, Satan is that, Satan is interfering with this. It is Satan that doesn't give me rest. Give it a break. 
The Bible says when Jesus died, from Genesis was promised that when he is on the cross, he will crush the head of our enemy. He takes their power, their authorities from you and from me. If you are in a slave to the enemy, it is you that you don't understand what Christ has done. It is me that I may not understand what Christ has done. He says that he removed the power of our enemies from our lives. We are free to rejoice in the middle of the storm. We are free to rejoice in the middle of sorrow. We are free to rejoice in the middle of pain and agony that we go through. When our body is broken, we know that we know that we know that there is a peace that passes all understanding. And that will take us through. Friends, Jesus never promised a trouble-free, a pain-free life to you and to me. But he said, when you are going through it, I am with you. I walk with you. I talk with you. And we share the joy that we need to have together. Amen? That's what Jesus did. Colossians 2.15. Having disarmed. Do you know what that means? How many of you have been disarmed by the police lately? <laughs> Disarm means someone who is carrying a weapon and the authority comes and take that weapon out of your hand and disarm you that you have no authority, no power to do anything. That's what Jesus did with our enemies. He took every authority. You know, the Bible says that Satan is the Lord of the earth today. And he has been given some authorities that Jesus took all of that from him. He has no authority over you and me as the children of God. He has disarmed all of the authorities. He made public spectacle of them triumphing over them by the cross. Oh, there is power on that cross that flows to us today. That old rugged cross, that old rugged cross, it covers, it bore all of my shame, all of my embarrassment, all of my sin, all of my guilt, that old rugged cross. Because the King of glory died on that cross to set me free, to set you free. Amen? Do not be hostage again. Do not yourself submit to the power, the authorities that they have no power and authority over God's children. Do not bow to the authorities that they might enslave you to sin again. Turn around, turn around. Romans 5, 6. You see, at just the right time, oh, to everything there is a season. To everything there is a time. Just at the time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God, Bad God. Could you say bad God? Bad God demonstrated his own love for us in this way. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for us. Let's talk about the scene of crucifixion a little bit. They brought Jesus to the hill of Golgotha, means the place of skull. They put him on the cross, nailed him to it, and then they raised him up. And next to him, one on the left, one on the right, there were two thieves, two robbers, two criminals. At the beginning, as people were scolding Jesus and yelling at him, if you are the son of God, if you are the king of Jews, come down and save yourself. That was the crowd. 
Also, the two thieves, they started to insult Jesus. Both of them. They were saying, if you are the Son of God, come down and save yourself. What you have to picture in your mind is this. Our Lord did not go to the cross as a victim. Anyone else that was to be crucified, they wouldn't resist. Just like today, when the police wants to arrest somebody, have you noticed how they resist, how they fight back, how they curse, how they swear? That was the condition for all the criminals, all people who were to be crucified, but not our Lord. Not our Lord. He did not say, oh, look what good I did to these people, now what they are doing to me. Woe me, everybody is against me. Nobody likes me. He actually, when Pilate says, I have the authority to hand you over, Jesus said, you have no authority except what my Father has given to you. When they wanted to whip him in the courtyard, he just walked there. Go for it. Beat him up. Whipped him up. Tore his flesh to pieces. He stood there and took it. He didn't cry, woe me, look what they are doing to me. Then they put his cross on his back to carry it to Golgotha. He didn't complain, oh, it's heavy. Oh, I cannot do it. Why they are doing this to me? When they nail him to the cross, he didn't scream, oh, oh, it hurts. You know what he was seeing? He was seeing my helplessness. He was seeing my hopelessness. For the joy that was set before him, he went to the cross, even death on the cross. You know what that joy was before him? My soul, your soul, my soul, our soul was set before him. That was his joy that he will free us. For the joy that was set before him, he endures death, even the death on the cross. Wow. Because you are precious in my sight and because I love you, do not be afraid. For I am with you, he says. So these two thieves, also they cursed, insulted Jesus until something happened. Here's the question for you. If today, this very hour, is your last hour, what would you do? What would you think? How would you respond to God? When Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing, something happened in the heart and in the mind of one thief, one criminal, one robber. Something happened. And he had to make a choice with us. He didn't have a chance to go to the Sunday school. He didn't have a chance to be baptized. He didn't have a chance to go to the Bible college. He didn't have a chance to serve at the church. He didn't have a chance to give anything to anybody. But oh my, oh my, he was the best Christian you can ever find. You know how? This is what he said. Jesus used seven words, but this man used only five words to Jesus. This is the first thing he said. He turned to the other thief. He said, don't you have any fear of God? Hey, how did he know that? The moment Jesus said, Father, forgive them, he realized that God 
is the holy God. God is to be revered. God is to be feared. Don't you fear God? What we are getting, we deserve, he said to the other guy. He has done nothing. He's innocent. He's pure. That's what he was saying. That is understanding who God is. This morning, if we understand who God is, our decisions and our plans and our thoughts most likely can change. He realized how holy God was. That's why he rebuked his friends. He acknowledged that God is a holy God. Many of us, we take God very lightly. We take God as our buddy. We take God as somebody that is an acquaintance to us. We can tease him, say things to him, or do things to him without even blinking. But the man realized, God is the holy God, and I am filthy, and I am guilty, and I am troubled. I deserve this. The second thing he said, he said we have a condition (laughs) as a human being. You and I, we are sinners, you dummy. That's what he said. We killed people, we robbed people, we cheated people, we deceived people, we lied, blah, blah, all the stuff that counted. He said, as human beings, we have no hope in and by ourselves. Don't you understand that? You and I, we are here because of what we have done. That describes the condition of human being. How hopeless, helpless we are when we don't know God. I love the next line. He called Jesus Lord. Wow. Lord, remember me. You know what Lord means? Lord means the owner, the master. Someone who has all the authority over us. Lord means that someone that we are his property. He can do whatever he wants to do with us. He acknowledged who Christ was. You know, we can say Jesus is our Savior. That's good because he saved us. Jesus is God because he's the Son of God. But oh, how awesome it is if we constantly acknowledge the Lordship of Jesus. That he is my owner. He can do whatever he desires to do with me. And I bow in obedience to that lordship of his. Question for you. Do you know him as the Lord over your life? Not just the Savior. As the Lord over your life, that he can do whatever he desires to do with you, and you cannot complain about it. That's called understanding who Christ is. Christ is the Lord of all. He is the Lord of Lords. And then the next line he used, look at this. He said, remember me. Meaning, I desire you. I want you. That is the call of salvation. Friends, that's the call of salvation. He said, I know who you are. I acknowledge your authority. I love you as my Lord and Savior, but remember me. I want to have that personal relationship with you. Remember me. Remember me. And the next line, he acknowledges not only the Lordship of Jesus, but he also acknowledges the kingship of Jesus. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Two things applies here. One, Jesus is the Lord and the King of kings, but also Jesus is going to come back to establish his kingdom. A king without kingdom is not a king. That's what he's saying. He's trying to tell us that Christ is not just the Lord, but also is a coming king, soon coming 
king. This is the end time prophecy. This is the end time approval of what this man is trying to tell to Jesus. You are the king of kings. You are the Lord of lords. You are going to come back. How did he know? The moment he realized he is God, he understood that God can be and can do all that he wants to be, all that he wants to do. Amen? That is a criminal's confession of faith. If you ever wanted to understand salvation, it's right there before you. Very simple and basic. This morning, though we all call ourselves children of God, but do we understand what we are saying? Here it says, God is holy. Here it says, we deserve the wrath of this holy God. That's the words of this thief. Here he says, Lord, you are the authority. You are the boss. You are my Lord. Then he says, I want to be with you. I want to have that personal fellowship back again. I want to be that guy that you created perfect back then. I want to restore that relationship with you. And then he says, be the king of my life. Reign and rule over me. Wow. The last minute of his life. He could have been bitter. He could have been mad. He could have been barking like a dog as the other one did. But wow, what a confession of faith from this man at Golgotha. Amen? You are going to have communion today together. If our friends come and the worship team come back, Isaiah 40, 53 actually talks about how Christ willingly walked to the cross without being dragged or coerced or forced to that. When he was on the cross, he was not a victim. He didn't have a victim mentality. Many of us, we have victim mentality, unfortunately. Woe me. Nobody likes me. Nobody wants me. I am the one that has been persecuted. I am the one that has been mistreated. Oh man, listen to the words of Isaiah 53. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord have been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of the dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. Go ahead. Guys. He was despised. Go ahead, guys, go ahead. He was despised and rejected. Thank you. And we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain, bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was peace for my sins, for our sins. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought you and I peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, 
yet he did not open his mouth. Wow. He was not a victim. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before the shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. When you look at Jesus, the Bible says, sheep needs to be led. Sheep follows when you lead. Doesn't resist. Goats, they resist. Cows, they resist. Dogs, they resist. Sheep don't resist. He said Jesus did not resist when they led him to the cross. He just walked behind them without any complaint, without any resistance. He was like a sheep, like a lamb that going before his slaughters. He was silent. He did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet, who of his generation protested? Have you noticed a couple of years ago, a gentleman named George Floyd was arrested by the police and the police put his knees on his neck and all stuff. The whole world was up in uproar. The whole world was protesting about this. And when my Jesus died, no one even cared. No one even said, why? You see here? No one even cared. Well, he was assigned a grave with the wicked. And with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. You are the will of the Lord in the hand of Jesus. You see, the Father prospers Jesus through your life, through my life, and the souls who turn to God. It says, after he has suffered, he will see the light of life that's talking about his resurrection. And be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many. We are here this morning as a testimony of this. And he will bear their sins. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great. And he will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death and was murdered with the transgressors, the two thieves on the cross. That's what he's talking about here. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. What an awesome passage of the scriptures to read, meditate, contemplate and pray through it. Amen? The Bible says, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread after supper, after giving thanks to the Father, he broke it and he gave it to his friend. He said, this is my body, broken for you. Oh, this morning, every illness, every infirmity, Everything that is holding us hostage is broken by the broken back of Jesus. Only if we believe it. Amen? So let's partake it and be thankful for it together.
The Bible says in the same manner, he took the cup after giving thanks to the Father, he gave it to his friend. He said, this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant. Everything that was to be work, it is removed from us now. We don't have to sacrifice a lamb. We don't have to sacrifice a pigeon. We don't have to bring a dove to the house of the Lord to be justified. We just come through the blood of Jesus, through the cross of Calvary. That is the way to the Father. Amen? Let's partake it and be thankful for it. Thank you, Lord. Let's stand together and sing.
if you truly want to know the meaning of this song, when you get home, grab a rose. You can do two things with it. Crush it in your hand, you see how the smell come out of it. Or just walk on it, you see how the aroma of the rose will come. When Jesus died, that was the rose of heaven that was crushed and spread the aroma of God's love to us. That's what it means. He was crushed like a rose and the aroma of heaven came to us. It is called Good Friday not because it is good things that happen. It is because the goodness of God came to us. It is Good Friday because the goodness of God came to us. Amen? Now, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you, be gracious to you, turn His face towards you, and give you peace in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Coffee, cookies are there. Fellowship with each other.